So again, welcome to this conference, Voices of Conscience, and to our opposition in the military. Welcome to everyone here at uh, Notre Dame and to those who are watching us on video. Yeah. And how fortunate we are to be here together this week and to have this opportunity to explore the military movements against war and injustice that have been vital to our lives and that are crucial to the cause of peace. We gather here as scholars and activists joined together in research and social action to consider the role of anti-war soldiers and veterans in the construction of peace. We are members of the Vietnam generation and also veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan and of the so-called War on Terror. We are passing the baton of scholarship and activism to a new generation. During our time together these days, we will address and I hope dispel some of the core myths perpetrated by the war makers in our culture. We are told that the veterans who returned from Vietnam were spit upon and disrespected <coughs> by anti-war activists, by a society indifferent to their sacrifice. On the contrary, the anti-war movement welcomed and supported those of us who stood up for peace. We were invited to march in the front ranks of major anti-war rallies. Look at the pictures from those days. You can see us there, marching on the lead, unmistakable by our short haircuts. Well, at least we had hair then. Uh, and often wearing those silly GIs for peace caps. But we were proud to do so because by our presence, we showed that the anti-war movement represented every walk of life, a vast outpouring of American society from the working classes as well as the middle class. We're also told that the Vietnam War could have been won if the military had been allowed to fight on to the victory that was supposedly within reach. On the contrary, the Army was falling apart by 1969, riven by internal resistance, racked by dissent, already in an advanced state of institutional decay. And the Navy and the Air Force were not far behind, rapidly declining by 1971. Combat effectiveness was eroding rapidly and would have declined even more if they had tried to send us back into combat. The war makers believed that ending the draft and creating an all-volunteer force would eliminate dissent within the military and silence the thinking soldier. On the contrary, many soldiers in the volunteer force spoke out against the invasion and occupation of Iraq. They helped to create movements such as the Appeal for Redress and Iraq Veterans Against the War. They are among the many troops who have questioned the wisdom and the legality of the so-called War on Terror. In this conference, we will write and archive the history of our movement so that others will know the truth about the horror and the immorality of these wars, and will have the courage to speak truth to power. But this conference is not only about history. It is about the present. We stand in solidarity today with the students and community activists who are organizing against the scourge of gun violence in our schools and in our streets, just as we have marched in the past to prevent war and armed violence abroad. We join hands with all the movements of today in lifting up the voices of soldiers and veterans for justice and peace. We know that soldiers and veterans have unique authority and influence in speaking about war and against war and we can help sway public opinion toward peace. We need that voice today, again. By highlighting the contributions of the past, we hope in this conference to encourage new military voices of conscience today. To guide us in this journey, at this opening panel, we have four distinguished panelists. We'll start with Susan Snall, who was court-martialed for dropping anti-war leaflets from a rented plane over military bases in the Bay Area, and then marched in uniform at the head of the October 1968 rally in San Francisco. It's amazing just to remember and say that again. <laughs> Jonathan Hutto, who read Soldiers in Revolt in 2006 while stationed aboard the USS Roosevelt in the Gulf, and joined with other service members to build a movement that became the Appeal for Redress. Nathan Smith, a recently retired intelligence officer from Kuwait who sees the danger of unchecked executive war making and filed a lawsuit against the constitutionality of the current endless war. 
And then Dr. Tao, director of the Vietnam War Remnants Museum, part of the International Consortium of Peace Museums, who debuted the Waging Peace exhibit and hosted the Veterans for Peace delegation visiting Saigon in March. Susan. Good afternoon. It is an honor to be part of an extraordinary special collection. I, I call it a collection, a group of people with whom I have worked, organized, fought, and disagreed these past 50 years, and for whom I feel deep admiration and respect. Those GIs and veterans who returned from war and armed conflict to work for peace and social justice in the United States. For them, it's been a wrenching, painful journey from war maker to peacemaker. To be able to question both themselves and their country that participated in an unjust, immoral conflict. To be able to look at their adolescent selves and question their very identity, to take a moral journey back to a time when they were in a country thousands of miles from US borders, members of a military that was killing and destroying the people in Southeast Asia. Those once young American Vietnam soldiers have become old men now and live with the memory of what they did so many years ago. They don't want to be thanked for their service in Vietnam. They want to be forgiven. They have returned from introspection and critical self-analysis, remembering the past and healing themselves through working for peace and social justice. Our nation has not yet used its vast resources of power to end the long night of poverty racism, and man's inhumanity to man. I am disappointed with our failure to deal positively and forthrightly with the triple evils of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism. We are presently moving down a dead-end <clears throat> road that can lead to national disaster. These were the words of Dr. Martin Luther King 50 years ago as he spoke on his subject, the war in Vietnam and the Poor People's Campaign in 1967. Dr. King was denounced by other civil rights leaders and by the press, by the public that wanted to know what gave him the expertise to talk about international politics. I'd like to speak for a couple of minutes about an organization that provided medical presence for Dr. King and for those who marched in the South, the Medical Committee for Human Rights, an organization founded in 1964 as a civil <coughs> rights organization. During its years of existence, it desegregated hospitals in the South built and sustained community health centers in the Mississippi Delta, along with the production of food co-ops. They raised millions of dollars working with public health advocates who regarded developing programs in the South and Northern ghettos at MCHR's priority, wanting to maintain a distance from the political controversies they felt were not related to health care. That changed in 1967 when MCHR adopted a strong statement against the war and against American public sentiment. That year, MCHR physicians initiated a national program to provide physical and psychological examinations for young men who believed that they might be ineligible for medical reasons but they lacked the funds to pay for those services. In 1967, a peace march was led by GIs in Madison, in Cleveland, in Atlanta, at Fort Benning, Georgia. Jackson, South 
Carolina. There was a pray in on base. There were numerous events that went on in 1967. 1968, which is kind of my year for remembrance, um, began with the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, the National Liberation Front attacking 110 cities and provinces in the South. The North Vietnamese Army encircling Marine troops at Khe San. There were several national draft card burnings, selective service cards burning. The government considered those to be the property of the United States government, not those of the young men who were subject to the draft. Martin Luther King was assassinated one year after his speech on Vietnam. And materialism, militarism, and racism. Federal troops were sent to Chicago. Columbia University exploded against Defense Department contracting as well as the encroachment into the neighborhood. 200,000 high school students boycotted classes. The police rioted at the Democratic National Convention. 43 troops refused to be deployed to Chicago. There were the very bloody battles for, for way. And there was what became very public, a horrifying photo of the execution of a National Liberation Front soldier. General Westmoreland requested additional troops as the Paris peace talks began. The Catonsville Nine were found guilty of destruction of selective service files and sent to prison. At the Presidio in San Francisco, GI sat down and sang, we shall overcome. They were charged with mutiny and faced life imprisonment. Active duty soldiers protested the war in Vietnam. Some went to prison for several years. Some left their families and friends to move out of the country and gave up everything to protest an unjust, illegal, immoral war. From the summer of 1967 to 1969, I was a Navy nurse at Oak Knoll Hospital in California. I was assigned to the surgical and orthopedic wards. They were World War II barracks, crowded with 35 to 40 patients, all young men <coughs> who had been wounded in Vietnam. They were very young, 17, 18, 19 years old. Some were missing limbs. Some were so shot up, they had tubes coming out from various parts of their bodies draining excess fluids. One I remember specifically who was young, 18 years old. He was on his way to surgery for a foot amputation. He was terribly frightened and crying. I tried to grab a hold of his stretcher as the doctors were wheeling him out, and I asked him to talk to me. He said he was scared of dying. And as we started to talk, the doctors pulled away the gurney and said they didn't understand why he would be so scared because it was only his foot that was being amputated. After all, they had seen so much worse on other soldiers. But he was chilled and shaking as they moved his bed out and down the ramps to the operating room and his death and I couldn't protect him from the war, from his fear, from his dying. It was at night that the cries and screams of pain and fear would start on those long open wards, each unit a wooden shack, holding 40 steel-framed old-fashioned hospital beds filled with young men. At night, the lights would be turned off so they could sleep and dream their nightmares of war, of dead and dying buddies rotting in the dense jungle in a faraway country. 
these youngsters would scream out their agony. My leg, my leg, it's been blown away. Be careful, there's a trip wire in the grass. Agonizing cries and panic yells. Give me something for the pain, I can't take it. The cacophony would start at one end of the long unit and be carried by the next man-child. I told you I need something for this pain. Their limbs were held aloft by butcher-like tools used to elevate an arm or a leg that had open wounds oozing infection. Pus and blood mixed together in stumps that would always remind them of their war and their loss. I could heal them, make them whole again, ease their passage back into society and family until I couldn't and realized that this war had to stop. This was during the height of the American war in Vietnam. I watched the battles on TV at home and lived the war at work. I was against this terrible destruction and waste, and yet I had become part of it. I had a responsibility to act and work with others to stop the war. And as a member of the armed forces, it was imperative to inform the American people that there were active duty GIs who were also against the conflict in Southeast Asia and who supported the troops by wanting to bring them home. In 1968, I knew that I could no longer be silent. David has quickly told you the synopsis of the story, but we were forming a GI and Veterans March for Peace in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we had difficulty leafletting the bases and getting the word out. And so I thought, okay, we could load up a small plane and put the leaflets about the demonstration in the plane and drop them on military bases in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we flew over Oaknoll Naval Hospital, Treasure Island, Yerba Buena Island, um, and we flew into the airspace of Alameda Naval Air Station and dropped the flyers on the deck of the USS Ranger. I, th <laughs> it was not the most, I have to admit, it was not the most creative idea. I had gotten it from what the U.S. was already doing in Vietnam by dropping flyers in South Vietnam, urging people to go to these so-called protective hamlets. In every country, in every culture, we believe that children are our future. Our children are to be loved, treasured, cared for. As adults, we take that responsibility as the most important work we do in life. It is our nature to protect our children from harm. We watch over them when they're ill. We cry with them when they're in pain. We protect them from those who would harm them. How do we prevent their hurt from an unseen enemy? From something we carry in our bodies and transmit to them unknowingly. The dioxin in Agent Orange not only impacts the lives of those who were in Vietnam during the American War, causing deteriorating illnesses and death, but it can also be transmitted to children, causing changes in cells that last multiple generations, causing birth defects and problems for children and grandchildren of those directly exposed. The legacy of that conflict continues with the births of babies born with severe birth defects from the use of Agent Orange over 57 years ago. Babies who never volunteered for the military, who never held a gun or dropped a bomb whose parents were in southern Vietnam and who became the target for this chemical herbicide. We leave many toxic elements behind after a war. In Vietnam, we left poison in the land and people. Today, 57 years after the initial spraying of Agent Orange dioxin, 
the United States and Vietnam have reconciled and developed trade agreements. But we, the American people, have more work to do. I think of those lives changed forever by war and conflict. And along with millions of others, rededicate myself to healing the wounds of war, to working for peace and social justice, to bringing an end to armed conflict, to move us from a war economy to a peace economy, to care for those harmed, and to stop this insanity called war, to end corporate power and destruction, to instead be life-giving instead of death-giving. For if we who have known war don't dedicate ourselves to ending it, who will? Thank you. Susan took quite a bit out of me. That was a very, very strong. Thank you, Susan. First and foremost, let me thank, uh, thank David and thank the committee uh, that I've gotten to know via email, Hannah and Lisa, uh, Karen, his faithful partner, his best half, and David, uh, and everyone that, that helped to put this uh, conference together. Give yourselves a strong peace hand if you will. I um, So I come from the X generation. So Generation X is that generation that goes from about 1962 to roughly about 1981, 82, I believe. So I was born in 1977. So for those in my generation who were politicized, uh, we were politicized through uh, the prism of the civil rights movement. Uh, for some of us, the Black Power movement, the Vietnam Peace Anti-War Movement. And so in my house, there was a fusion of the civil rights movement and the Vietnam Peace Movement. Both of my parents, having been born in an apartheid South, my father, Denmark, South Carolina, 1942, my mother, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 1947. She entered Clark College, now Clark Atlanta University, 18 years later in 1965 in Atlanta, Georgia. And so as a child growing up, uh, my mother politicized me, not so much through books, but through her oral stories, which when she told them to me were very vivid. Um, she was very, very vivid about a colleague, a friend of hers at Clark Atlanta who had been drafted to Vietnam, his name was Claude. And she talked about this long walk that they had one morning where she, where he, excuse me, let her know that he was going to Vietnam. And, and then she began to talk about these letters that would arrive, and these subsequent letters that would arrive. And, and all of a sudden, the letters weren't coming anymore. In the early 80s, we were a family that drove everywhere. I don't know if you grew up in a family like that. I didn't take my first flight until I was 18 years old. Uh, but we drove to Washington, D.C. The year was 1983, I believe. And we visited the, uh, the Vietnam Memorial there, the wall. And, uh, you know, my mother is a very strong woman. Uh, I'd never seen my mother weep and cry and, 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 uh, and release in the way that I witnessed that morning. My father had to uh, hold my brother and I and explain to us uh, what the weeping was about. And um, it, was, it was her friend Claude who she saw on that wall and several others uh, from her neighborhood in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So that was my education to the impact of war on a community, but not just there within my home, but in my local community where I grew up. Um, you know, the, there was this, um, this correlation, if you will, between being a veteran and actually struggling in society. My mother remarried when I was 10 years old. She married a Vietnam War vet. 
the late Joseph Wingfield Cooper. He had a, an incision across his stomach and a wound in his back where he got shot through the back in Vietnam and it came out through his stomach. And he would have the <clears> most <throat> horrible ulcers and headaches yearly, at least at times an ear infection that would go along with the headache. And so we, we, we had to go to the Veterans Hospital at least two to three times a year um, to look out for Joe. And there was sometimes he would have the most horrible nightmares. So this is when I would hear, as Susan referred to earlier, of tripwire. This is why I would hear terms like, well, I won't say that term, but just starts with a G, you know, the, the racist term and how, they, and how Vietnamese uh, high brothers and sisters there were described. And so that was my politicization but that politicization also took place within the social milieu of growing up in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, this was the city they said was too busy to hate. Um, this was the city uh, where Julian Bond was still serving as state senator when he and John Lewis got into a historic congressional uh, race in 1986. And so the story of Julian Bond having stood up against the Vietnam War and being denied his seat in the Georgia State Legislature, this was the city where all of us, I believe, unconsciously saw ourselves as Dr. King's kids. We all did. Um, and so the, the, uh, even to this day, um, there's an incident, it's in interesting incident. I have a friend who just, re just recently became a gun owner, uh, a female. And it's, it's due to the way she's internalizing the political environment that we live in. And she says to me, Jonathan, haven't you ever thought about becoming a gun owner? And I said, no. I, I haven't. And she said, why? I said, well, okay, it's not because my family didn't believe in guns. I mean, my father had a rifle in the house. But I said, it's because of the way I was politicized. You know, I, I live nonviolently in the society because of the way I internalized the teachings of the civil rights movement. Uh, 1986 King's holiday becoming a national holiday. Just give me a little background in terms of what made me who I am. But in terms of how I came to become an organizer, that's, that's the construct that I labor in. Uh, it took place on the campus of Howard University. I entered Howard University in the fall of 1995. I went to college in that ideal sense of finding yourself, your calling. Who am I? What am I? What am I born to do? I went there to challenge every ideal that I thought I knew and understood that I thought was true. And it was there on that campus that I became a student organizer. My junior year, I became student body president. There's a pen that I wear in the middle of my chest here. This is the late Kwame Ture, known to your generation as Stokely Carmichael. And we last brought him on Howard University's campus, February 17th, 1998. I will never forget it as long as I live. I introduced him that night. He left us with some dictums that evening that burned my brain. I believe it bathed my veins, to be honest with you. I truly do, because I internalized it very deeply. Uh, for those of you who know the history of the Civil Rights Movement, you know the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was the first organization to come out against the war in Vietnam in 1966, uh, right after the murder of Sammy Young. Sammy Young, a student at Tuskegee Institute, who was a Navy veteran who was killed for attempting to use the white only restroom at a gas station at Tuskegee University. It was after the death of Sammy Young, the first black student to be killed in the civil rights struggle, that the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee issued a statement against the war in Vietnam and calling on the civil rights movement to get on board. And so Kwame, he talks, he talks a bit about his assignment as he internalized it to really stay on top of Dr. King and the SCLC to come out against the war. But the dictum, there's, there's a number of dictums, but one that I internalized, uh, there's several that I, would, that I would state here this evening. One he said to us was he said that some people don't understand the real essence of our struggle. He said the real essence of our struggle is eternal. He said, that is to say, there's no time for us to simply kick back, relax, and enjoy life. He said, if you think this way, this is reactionary thinking of the worst order. He then went further to say, because the more you struggle, the more you know. He said, the more you know, the more you can do. And he said, your people are going to need you to do until you die. Now, he said this to, to me when I was 
to us rather, a packed house of Howard students two months before my 21st birthday. So I'm saying, struggle until I die. <laughs> I'm trying to wrap my head around, well, what, what, till I die? And then he went on to define struggle. He says, struggle was the basic qualification of life. To engage in struggle, to make life better. And then, and so I said, huh. I, and so I'm still internalizing this. Well, it's been 20 years later. And, and now I understand a little better now, David, what Kwame Stokely was leaving with us that day. It was in that same speech that he spoke about the Vietnam War, juxtaposing himself to Colin Powell. And there was a point in the speech where he says, Colin said, hell yes. He said, I said, hell no, I'm not going. And then he, went, he goes on to say that you know, he never had a problem with the Vietnamese. He had a problem with uh, racism here in America. He goes on that litany. But I internalized a lot of what he left with us that evening. And I went on to become an organizer working with human rights organizations, civil liberties organizations. Uh, a story I won't tell here as to how I ended up in the United States Navy for the sake of time, but I ended up joining and enlisting the United States Navy at age 26, uh, ideologically as an anti-war sailor, uh, not believing that I was going to be organizing in the Navy, David. Uh, but when I got within the ranks, Let's just say I caught hell. And, and, and then I went UA. Uh, I remember when I did it, uh, David. It was January of 2005. I said, I'm not going to stay in this Navy anymore. And that was when an old professor of mine, o O L E, not O L D, uh, uh, O, because no one's old, right? We, we, we just get better with time. Ain't that right? Uh, old professor of mine sent me, he gave me this book. It was, they had just republished it, Soldiers in Revolt. And he talked to me at length about, um, time check, time check. How much time I got left? Ten. Ten minutes ago. He gave me this book, Soldiers in Revolt. It had just been republished by Haymarket Books. And his name is Rodney Green. Uh, he's former chairman of the economics department at Howard University. But he was drafted out of Yale University in 1971. Uh, and because of his ideological commitment, uh, he did not resist the draft, and actually he consciously went in to organize in the military uh, with a small cohort of others. Uh, he was stationed at Fort Dix, also Fort Belvoir. He participated in a number of organizational campaigns within the ranks. The one that he's most proud about is the campaign to free Billy Dean Smith, uh, who, I know, who I know all of you know. Yes, y'all can clap to Billy Dean. I wasn't around for that, but you all were. Y'all can count. Um, <laughs> But uh, he's very proud of that. He's very proud of when he was at Fort Belvoir. He resisted riot duty on the Washington Beltway when demonstrations were taking place. But he gave me this book. He said, John, you got to read this. He said, and then you got to go back <laughs> and turn yourself in. And I thought he was crazy. I thought he was crazy. I, mean, I, I said, I'm not going back to the Navy. He said, no. He says, if you go back, he said, if you take the punishment, he says, and embed yourself a little more deeply with your shipmate. He said, you'll begin to make the shop life a little better. And you may even be able to wage some struggle within. And so I, I read David's book. And let's just say I was, uh, I was lit, as the, young, as, as the millennials would say. I was lit when I read this book uh, and came upon the history of the GI movement, a movement that I knew very little about. Um, it says a lot about who tells our history, who, who actually tells the story. Because up until this point, the resistance in Vietnam movement was not something that was internal to the military within my mind. It was something that was external to the military. And so when I was deployed off the coast of Iraq uh, in February 2006, fighting a struggle against racism in my shop, which we'll talk about tomorrow in our panel, I contacted David. And surprisingly to me, he, he responded back to me expeditiously. And when my ship came back into port March of 06, we brought David to Norfolk to talk to about 75 peace, uh, peace activists. About a dozen of us were active duty. One of the people in that room was Liam Madden, who was a Marine out of Quantico, Virginia. We then began to have a discussion about what we could do during this, the war that we was in, Operation Iraqi Freedom, they called it, but the Iraq occupation, Afghan occupation, what we could do. And then we became barracks lawyers, David. Uh, and then uh, in conjunction with the Center for Conscience and War Bill here, and J.E. McNeil, 
We began to comb the regs, as they say, and came across the Military Whistleblower Protection Act, which says that any active duty military member without prior command approval can contact a member of Congress on any issue. That became the basis for the appeal for redress. And so before I give you this snippet of a video, about a five minute video I want you to see uh, about the appeal, I don't want to talk the whole time. I want, I, want to, I want to say a couple of things. Number one, on what I learned from the appeal for redress. Number one, and David alluded to it, the moral authority of active duty, not when we had 500 signatures, not when we had 200 signatures, when we had 65 signatures, we launched the October 06, within about a week and some change, 65, there's press in a White House press briefing asking the press secretary at the time about the appeal for redress. The Pentagon is having to respond as whether or not we have the right to do this. And they affirmed that we did. The commander, Chris Sims, the naval commander in Norfolk, had to go on the press and respond that we had a right to do this. When we got the 600 plus signatures, then that's when Nation Magazine reached out to us, David. I spent a lot of my Thanksgiving holiday reaching out to the 600 plus signatures we had at that time. Got 45 responses, over half, a little over half of them on the ground in Iraq. 24 of them were interviewed for this article, and 13 of them actually were flown out February of 07 for this piece that you're getting ready to watch here. Um, this piece here on the appeal for redress. I am beyond um, moved to be here with you all today. Uh, your generation paved the way for my generation. I thank all of you. I don't know all your names, but I thank all of you, love all of you immensely for your sacrifice and for all that you've done. And I can only say that I would do my absolute best to continue to carry it on. Americans in the military have been asked to make extraordinary sacrifices in recent years, particularly in Iraq, where the casualties are mounting, tours of duty are being extended, and some of them have had enough. Tonight you'll hear dissension in the ranks from a large group of soldiers and Marines who are fed up and have decided to go public. They're not going AWOL, they're not disobeying orders, or even refusing to fight in Iraq. But as correspondent Lara Logan reports, they're doing something unthinkable to many in uniform, bypassing the chain of command to denounce a war they're in the middle of fighting. As a patriotic citizen who served two combat tours in Iraq, I just feel that this war, it's simply just not working out anymore and soldiers are dying there every day. Specialist Kevin Torres didn't always feel that way. He enlisted in the army right out of high school after 9-11. He's twice served in Iraq, patrolling the mainly Kurdish north of the country, carrying out combat patrols Hi, Roger. and goodwill missions. Hey. Here you go, buddy. I joined because I just wanted to make a difference. I wanted to be a part of our generation's war. Well, you've been on two deployments, and you didn't always feel this way. Was there a point at which, you know, something you experienced that made you think, um, yeah, in January, we are doing a routine presence patrol through the city of Fuija, and one of our trucks was hit by a roadside bomb, an IED, and it killed four of the soldiers out of the five that were in the truck. And during the recovery of the fallen soldiers, all the debris outside of the truck, and we just had, the truck was loaded with school supplies, and soccer balls, and crayons, and notebooks, and coloring books, we just want to help. And it was just a really eye-opening and frustrating experience because we're still getting killed out there. It's a sentiment echoed by all of the service members who are part of this protest. We gathered some of them in Washington, but they had to be off base, out of uniform, and off duty to speak to us on camera. They've all sent a petition called Appeal for Redress to their individual members of Congress, letting them know that staying in Iraq will not work and it's time for U.S. troops to come home. 
it's not about speaking out against the military or speaking out against the war. It's just we're here four years down the line, and there's not an end to it. What are we trying to accomplish over there? You know, what, is, what are we trying to do in Iraq? What do you think? I don't even know anymore. Well, what would you say to the people that say, all right, it's clear that the war in Iraq is incredibly difficult um, and life is really tough both for Americans and for Iraqis, but pulling out is not the answer. It's only going to get worse. There's going to be all-out civil war. How does that become the default? Either some, someday we have to leave. We can't stay in Iraq for the next thousand years. Is there a possibility that Iraq might be better off if American troops stay there and finish the job. But then our lives are hanging in the balance of a flip of a coin. That doesn't seem worth it to you. Those are not good odds. Yes, I mean, we volunteered to make a difference, not just be part of an experiment. The idea for this protest by active duty and reserve service members came from two enlisted men who served in the war. Marine Sergeant Liam Madden, who got to Iraq during the Battle of Fallujah and whose military commitment is up this winter. And Naval Petty Officer Jonathan Hutto, who serves on the USS Theodore Roosevelt, which was deployed in the Gulf during Operation Iraqi Freedom. I'm not anti-war. I'm not a pacifist. I'm not opposed to uh, protecting our country and defending our principles. But at the same time, as citizens, it's our obligation uh, to have a questioning attitude you know, about policy. Just because we volunteered for the military doesn't mean we volunteered to, to put our lives in unnecessary harm and to carry out missions that are illogical and immoral. They say they're permitted to express their opinions because of the 1995 Military Whistleblower Act. Although it prohibits them from speaking against the Commander-in-Chief or any of their superior officers, it does allow members of the armed forces to speak on their own behalf and to make a protected communication to Congress. A senior officer in the Marine Corps um, said to me when I asked him about the appeal, what was his opinion, and, and he served in both Iraq wars. Um, he said, I have a hard enough time getting young men to put themselves in harm's way without having to have men in uniform tell them it's not worth it. We're not telling young men and women that it's not worth it uh, to serve their country. Uh, we've served our country. Um, the men and women uh, who have signed the appeal have served their country. So, no, it's, we're not saying it's not worth it. We're saying that if you have reservations about it, to communicate it. That's simply what it is. There are going to be a lot of people who don't like what you're doing. By volunteering, we've done more than about 99% of the population. And anybody who joined after 9-11 when the country was at a state of war, it's my opinion that Nobody has the right to question that soldier's patriotism. Nobody. There are going to be a lot of people listening to this who say that you're a... outgrowth on what you just had to say because unfortunately if Congress had listened five ten years earlier I wouldn't be here today talking about my story um, but unfortunately that's not the case so here I am you got to put up with me for 15 minutes um, so good afternoon my name is Nathan Smith and it's wonderful to be here with you today um, and have an opportunity to share in this dialogue that's just really important for modern day um, American society and kind of the place that we're at right now as a country, I think. Um, before I get, get started, I just want to thank David for inviting me to be here and for his team um, for facilitating me being here. Um, just really appreciate that and I'm really glad that I am here. Um, and then also everybody that's here today um, to, to partake in this. Um, <clears throat> this event is like a really uplifting reminder uh, for me um, in a time where it seems like there's a lot of apathy, a lot of apathy in the American public for what's going on um, in our foreign policy, our increasing, increasingly militaristic foreign policy. Um, it's, it's uplifting to know that there's people here um, today that care about these issues um, and are looking for a different way uh, to go about doing things. Um, 
So that said a little bit about me. Um, I'm a former active duty Army captain. Um, I come from a three generation military officer family. Uh, my grandfather, who's still living, is a 95 year old World War II veteran fighter pilot. Um, my parents were both Navy captains. My sister, who's in the audience, uh, was actually the battalion commander of the Notre Dame ROTC and ROTC unit about 10 years ago and served four years in the Navy as a service warfare officer. Um, so hopefully that highlights to you kind of where my family is with military service. Um, I personally spent seven years of, on active duty in the Army. Um, I did two deployments in support of what, was, what has been called the war, global war on terror. Uh, the first one was to Afghanistan in 2012, northern Kunar province, uh, for eight months. And then the most recent one was in 2015-16 for 12 months to Kuwait in support of Operation Inherent Resolve, which is the name for the counter-ISIS mission in Iraq and Syria. Um, for our purposes here today, um, I'm going to talk mainly about the events that occurred uh, with me in Kuwait. But feel free to ask me um, after this event or after this panel about any of my time in Afghanistan or anything else you want to know uh, as well. Um, so I'm going to tell you one particular aspect of that, of that Kuwait deployment um, and that I think is really relevant to our discussion. So while I was there actively working as an intelligence analyst on the operations floor, um, I became the plaintiff in a federal lawsuit. Uh, the crux of that case is that uh, President Barack Obama's order to deploy me in support of Operation Inherent Resolve was illegal due to a lack of congressional authorization for that specific mission as mandated by the 1973 War Powers Resolution. So first let's begin with the factors that drove me into being the plaintiff in that case. Uh, so my unit was originally notified of the pending deployment to Kuwait and Iraq early in 2015. Uh, like most members of the military, we'd been anxiously watching um, developments in Iraq and Syria over the previous year. Um, if you'll remember during that time, ISIS had coalesced out of the remnants of what had uh, formerly and probably erroneously been called Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, they had come together and because of their superior motivation, organization, and leadership structure, they'd made rapid territorial gains in uh, for Syria and then uh, in Iraq that was riven with sectarian divides, uh, a lot due to Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki's sectarian excesses. So I deployed with my unit to Camp Arif John Kuwait in August of 2015, and we began the long process of establishing a functional headquarters to oversee the counter-ISIS fight there. Prior to the deployment, <clears throat> I'd also closely followed the political de developments pertaining to the mission supposedly impending congressional authorization in the form of what many in the U.S. military believe to be an inevitable, inevitable congressional vote on a new authorization for the use of military force, or AUMF, which would be specific to that conflict. More than three years later, and as that mission is now winding down, as ISIS is, is basically been basically destroyed in Iraq and Syria, I'm still waiting for that vote from Congress. Anyone who's familiar with the American military will know that our system is somewhat unique in that military officers take an oath to, quote, support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And in doing so, they swear their loyalty to a system of government rather than to a particular individual. Many of the legal briefs submitted by my team in support of the lawsuit focus on the history of that oath, which was developed by Congress uh, to ensure loyalty to the system of government rather than to the executive. In one brief in particular, we highlighted the subtle differences in the officer and enlisted oath, uh, which Congress made over the years to further emphasize this theme. The action which I took in Kuwait to initiate my lawsuit was driven by the seriousness with which I held my commissioning oath every single day that I served in uniform for seven years. Um, the lawsuit uses numerous existing legal precedents to make the point that officers in particular are expected to act within the confines of the Constitution at all times. One of the precedents featured most prominently by my legal team in the crafting of arguments was the 1804 uh, court case Little v. Berean. In this case, the Supreme Court scrutinized the actions of a U.S. naval captain who had expressly ignored a law passed by Congress 
disallowing the seizure of foreign vessels bound from a French port. In the episode, Captain Little essentially claimed his actions were justified due to the existence of an executive order with a broader mandate than the congressionally passed statute. The Supreme Court disagreed and found Little liable for damages. We believe this case to be directly applicable to the specifics of my situation in Kuwait in 2015 because it de demonstrates the supremacy of congressionally passed statutes over executive diktats, especially on issues pertaining to war power, which the founders explicitly granted to Congress in the framing of our Constitution. In Smith v. Obama, we argue that as in Little v. Barim, the War Powers Resolution of 1973 constitutes existing law, which binds the actions of serving military officers, and therefore President Obama's deployment order to me was fundamentally illegal because it attempts to circumvent the War Powers Resolution's mandate that Congress explicitly authorize new military operations within a prescribed timeline. Now, DOJ will tell you that they have done so because they've they have authorized funding for that war. But if you closely read the wording of the War Powers Resolution, you will see that, that in the framing of that law, uh, Congress put language in there showing that appropriating funding was not in itself sufficient as congressional authorization. And we've pointed this out on numerous times in our legal briefs. So. Uh, my team and I believe that due to my direct participation in Operation Inherent Resolve and my presence in the command headquarters at the time of the filing of the suit, we'd be able to successfully navigate the issues of legal stranding which have hamstrung other attempts to use the WPR to question executive overreach on the matter of war powers in the post 9-11 era. Thus far, however, the courts have largely denied us the opportunity to get to the merits of the case and have manufactured issues of standing as a preferred way to avoid addressing the important questions that we bring up. In the district court, the case was originally dismissed on the issue of standing and an interpretation of the political question doctrine, which essentially states that if a dispute arises between the legislative and executive branches, legislative mechanisms are present to resolve that dispute outside of the courts. This erroneous interpretation of the PQD completely ignores the fact that the War Powers Resolution is already in existence and already represents the law of the land, therefore making Smith v. Obama at its core a simple matter of statutory interpretation, which is, of course, the main reasons that, that the founders established the judicial branch in the first place. The appeals court has initially taken the case more seriously, and we were invited to participate in oral arguments last fall before a three-judge panel. Even here, however, based on the questions uh, the just, from the justices, I received the ominous impression that a way, any way, was being sought to avoid ruling on the merits. This I feel to be the ultimate tragedy as I feel I and every other soldier are entitled to have our well-founded questions answered regarding the legal nature of the, of the mission sent down to us by an overreaching executive. In a post-Nuremberg world where, quote, I was just obeying orders, does not, does not and should not be sufficient in, in the place of personal officer or enlisted member uh, responsibility, um, I feel like our questions are fair and relevant. While the case is still pending and I've yet to abandon all hope for a seagull, serious legal review, my personal experience has led me to three depressing conclusions. In the post 9-11 era, the judicial branch has become far too deferential to the executive on matters of legal review when it comes to issues of national security. Our society and our military would be much better served if the courts demonstrated a willingness to actually conduct legitimate statutory interpretation as they did in the early days of the Republic as in the time of Barim. Second, Congress has rationally concluded, following the negative accountability visited on some legislature, legislators, following the Iraq invasion authorization vote of 2003, that the best course of action is always to dodge a tough vote and the associated accountability that that vote brings. In doing so, however, legislators form a legal gray area on recent military operations due to this very irresponsible abdication of responsibility. Inevitably, this causes war power decisions to flow exclusively to the executive branch, something the founders went out of their way to avoid. As Madison presciently stated, 
the executive branch would, quote, prove to be the branch of power most interested in war and most prone to it, end quote. Another founding father, George Mason, echoed Madison's prevailing sentiment of the time, saying he was for a system which favored, quote, clogging rather than facilitating war, end quote. In an era in American political life in which Congress appears more than capable of clogging on basically every issue, <laughs> it's truly a shame that the Congresses of recent years have proven so inept in this regard, which might actually relieve the American soldier, soldier of some of the burdens of perpetual war. And finally, the third and most painful conclusion. In the post-draft, post-Vietnam era, the American public largely does not care about the objective lists and misguided foreign policy blunders perpetrated by presidents on the American servicemen. In an age when taxes are never raised to fund new military adventurism, and less than half of 1% of the population actually serves in uniform, the true sting of perpetual war is felt by few Americans. In this new reality, the anti-war, at least pro-accountability movements of the past don't seem to manifest themselves with the same vigor. And the public appears less interested in holding representatives responsible for their lack of strategy in foreign policy. The founders may have gifted us with a constitution oriented towards deliberation, debate, and peace. But if the first two conditions never occur because the people aren't paying attention, we'll never get the third. I found myself reflecting often post-Kuwait about just how this intolerable status quo can be changed. Just how can we break this, silent, this cycle of perpetual war and return to our constitutional traditions? After all, the Vietnam generation appeared to enjoy some success if we can fairly consider the War Powers Resolution passed in 1973 over Nixon's veto to be representative of the greatest curtailment of executive war power since the framing of the Constitution itself. In my view, there's only one way to rep replicate this earlier success in the context of an American society so detached from its military. V veterans must stand up. Due to the unique nature of our system, active service members are largely barred from commenting on the policy decisions which have the potential to bring profound ch impact to their lives. Even in Kuwait, for instance, I declined from making public comment on the lawsuit bearing my name um, in the days immediately following its filing, I did this because I felt such action to be outside the spectrum of acceptable, acceptable conduct for a serving officer. In my view, I had challenged what I perceived to be an illegal order from inside the existing framework, and if the public cared to understand the logic behind that decision, the legal briefs were there for all to see. I did not, however, think it would be appropriate for me as an officer to go directly to the press and attempt to make my case to the public. That would have to wait until I took off the uniform. And so it was that when that uniform did come off in April of 2017, I eagerly looked to what I considered to be my natural allies in my, in my fight for accountability for my friends still serving in uniform. Um, and that, was, that natural ally should have been existing uh, veterans groups. Due to the high regard with which our society holds the military as an institution and veterans as a subset of that institution, most politicians crave the validations that veterans groups can provide. It's no coincidence that candidate Trump, proud holder of multiple draft affirmants from Vietnam and a man who has never served a single day in uniform, surrounded himself on the campaign trail with veterans and made flashy displays of charitable donations to their causes. These groups hold power and that power needs to be reflected in their platforms on political issues. It was appalling to me upon exiting active duty that as I browsed through the legislative platforms of all of the major veterans groups, I found not a single mention of the need to vote on a new AUMF and hold Congress accountable on matters of military conflict. As the voice for the voiceless in uniform, this must change. And, and we as the new generation of global war on terror veterans must change it. We must become involved with veteran organizations, infusing new blood and new perspectives into them. And we must demand that they begin speaking again for, the, for those in uniform. We must force the American public to pay attention, and in paying attention, demand that those representing them in Congress provide actual oversight again to an executive branch of both parties, mind you, bereft of anything other than military solutions and foreign policy strategies. 
Only then can we truly enjoy the benefits of the constitution of peace that our founders wish to gift us with. Thank you. Sisters and brothers, my name is Zheng Sun Tao. You can call me Tao. I am director of War Remnants Museum in Ho Chi Minh City, <coughs> Vietnam. Let me begin my speech today with a famous saying by President Ho Chi Minh on August 19, 1966. The first front against U.S. imperialism is in Vietnam, and the second one is right inside the United States. He continued under simultaneous attack on two fronts. American imperialism will certainly lose the war. The American people and the people of Vietnam will definitely win. I want to thank Dr. David Cochran for inviting me here today. And I want to say to each and every one of you that I am so very pleased to be here with you, the second friend. with a room full of people who believe in Guajin peace. And I am especially honored to once again be in the presence of the brave soldiers and veterans who risk so much to join and lead this second front while still in uniform. Their bravery was on full display in the special exhibition at the War Remnants Museum entitled Waging Peace, U.S. Soldiers and Veterans Who Opposed American War in Vietnam, which was open to visitors from March 19 to April 15 this year. This was an opportunity for Vietnamese and international visitors to understand more about the, the wide range of anti-war activities U.S. soldiers and veterans waged against the American war in Vietnam. <clears throat> During the exhibition, the dialogue, remembering the past and building the future, was held at the museum on March 20th with the participation of roughly 100 Vietnamese and U.S. veterans and guests. The dialogue not only featured the voices of historical witnesses from both sides, but also offered an opportunity for cultural exchanges among peace-loving activists. It roused the sympathy of veterans and people from both countries. And together with healing, reconciliation, and cope with the legacies of the war, it helped promote the relationship and comprehensive cooperation between our two countries. In less than a month of the exhibition, our museum attracted more than 120,000 visitors from both Vietnam and abroad. Additionally, more than 40 domestic and overseas new cases and articles featured the exhibition. 421 visitors wrote their feelings in our guest notebook. 
and we ourselves interviewed about Chen V sisters. Most of them were very touched, some even cried, and all sent the same message, which is make peace, not war. We were so pleased with the response that we plan to take the exhibit on the road and bring it to remote areas in Vietnam. This will give Vietnamese people living in the rural provinces the opportunities to learn more about the international support for the independent struggle of the Vietnamese people and about the peace movement that U.S. soldiers and veterans launched, launched against <coughs> the American war. Sisters and brothers, as President Ho Chi Minh once said, nothing is more precious than independence and liberty. Our people carry on many struggles against the wars of aggressions waged by the foreign forces to defend our own independence and liberation. Among them, the resistance to the American war was a long-lasting and arduous fight with enormous challenges. The war left behind a burdened Vietnam with heavy casualties including three million deaths and another two million people in jail. And among 4.8 million Vietnamese who were exposed to America's chemical warfare. Today, besides the good bilateral relationships in many fields like economics, cultures, and education, that have been maintained and fostered. Efforts have been continuously made by organizations and individuals, including U.S. veterans, to cope with the hundreds of thousands of unexploded ordnance and the toxic chemical legacy. However, Vietnamese people still need <coughs> to overcome many difficulties to move forward step by step and fully integrate into the global com communities. We always need care, sharing, and practical help dealing with the legacies of war, reviving dead lands, and responding to the remaining human suffering. Sisters and brothers, in the 42 years since its founding, the War Remnants Museum has served as a museum for peace. Every year, our museum receives over 1 million visitors, 70% of whom are foreigners, and many are Vietnamese and foreign state leaders and important politicians. The museum also serves as a bridge that links visitors with historical witnesses through exchanges with veterans, Asians, orphans, victims, and so on. Many Vietnam veterans of the United States came to the museum to meet and reconcile with veterans of the Vietnamese People's Army. They hug their former enemies and cried, and then they became friends. We hope that you will continue to see the War Remnants Museum as a venue to study and educate people on the love for peace and toss against the wars of aggression. Sisters and brothers, today, I am very honored and happy to be here and witness the exhibition, Question Peace, U.S. soldiers and veterans who oppose America's war in Vietnam held in the United States. 
Together, we can share the voices of concerns, not just anti-war voices of veterans and those in the U.S. military, but hopefully also the voices of all who are present here today who share the love for peace. Hopefully, this exhibition and conference will help Americans understand more clearly and devastation created by war and the value of peace. And from that understanding, together, we can make a world without war, a world where all countries can develop in peace and prosperity. Once again, thank you for giving me a chance to speak in this conference. Thank you. Thank you to all of the panelists, uh, such insightful, moving uh, presentations. Um, <coughs> just a quick point that uh, Ms. Tao is giving to all of us this little gift. It's a memento from the War Remnants Museum, and it has the peace dove over three missiles coming down representing, or three bombs representing the war against the Japanese, the French, and America. So this is our gift from Ms. Tao, so thank you very much for that. So we have time for your comments, your questions. Um, so please, if you want to address it to a specific panelist, please do so. Uh, we have microphones on either side, so wait till the microphone comes to you. Uh, do you want to point to? Yeah, I'll point to the question. So the floor is open uh, right there, Michael. You can take the first. Give us your name, please. Michael Kazin. Um, Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks for these great presentations. I um, want to ask Nathan and, and Jonathan too, I guess. Um, there's a lot of veterans um, running for office, I think, uh, this year, especially, and have, you know, in the recent past too. Um, and especially I'm interested in the, in the Democrats, <laughs> um, um, who you would think would want to say some of the things you guys have been saying, uh, speak out against um, the ongoing wars. Um, uh, but I wonder if they have been, and I wonder uh, if that is one avenue uh, to you know, uh, have an impact on policy in the present. Uh, after all, Americans pay attention uh, to politics during campaigns, and usually not other times. So well, now, who knows? But, but uh, uh, with President uh, Trump um, on tweet uh, on Twitter every day and every hour, but but um, uh, I wonder if you've had some contact with some of these veterans running for uh, for office and uh, whether that's an avenue for for change. Um, so that's a great point. I actually wrote an op-ed <laughs> with that with that as one of the topics. Um, interestingly, um, in the course of writing that op-ed. I was doing some research and I found that in the Congress just before 73, which was when the War Powers Resolution was passed, that was actually the high watermark in American history um, for veterans serving in Congress. It was like 73, 74% of Congress at the time. So it's interesting that at a time where you have a piece of legislation reflective of like the most, again, as I said, the, the greatest curtailment of executive war power in in American history after the framing of the Constitution, it coincides with a time of extreme veteran representation in Congress. And I don't think the public generally understands that veterans, I think, as you can see here, um, generally like that oversight from Congress. They're, they're not for just an overly powerful executive branch. So um, in answer to your question, if, have I had personal contacts with, with any of the veterans running? No, I haven't, but I think it's a great thing, and, I, and I'm not even speaking about for either party. I don't care what party it is. I just think veteran representation is great in Congress, and that can go a long ways to, to solving some of this problem. Um, to, to quickly expeditiously answer that, what, I, what, 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 my, what our study of movement history would say is that 
the way to curtail and end unjust wars, imperialist wars, is to organize a mass movement, um, first and foremost. Um, our study of history and the present uh, affirms to us uh, that unjust wars um, would not be ended uh, through the electoral process. Now, I want to be clear about this. I'm not saying that we should divorce ourselves from the electoral process. Uh, I believe we have an obligation to engage it. But I do believe that there is a limitation to it. So let me speak to my own involvement. In 2006, uh, there was a mandate given from the American public uh, that they wanted an immediate end to the occupation in Iraq and Afghanistan. And what we received from the Congress as a whole uh, was more hearings and more funding, more funding and more hearings. What the history of the GI movement says, to go back to the Vietnam era, is that ultimately it was not Johnson who ended the war in Vietnam. He escalated. Uh, ultimately, it wasn't Nixon. Certainly wasn't Kissinger. Certainly wasn't McNamara. Uh, that ultimately, it was people like you, all of you. It was those who were on the front lines in the streets and those who dared to take action, oftentimes radical and militant within the ranks uh, to curtail the war, driven to take those actions uh, because the politicians in Washington uh, would not act. And so what I would say is that it has to be an inside, outside approach. We, I think we should engage the electoral process, but I think we should also understand the limitations of it, but understand the only way we can even empower the electoral process is if we actually have a mass movement that actually gives some teeth and a backbone to the politicians so they, they can stand up. So there's a constituency that backs them they can speak to. Other questions? Um, anyone? Questions? Yeah, this is specifically to Nathan Smith. Have you considered looking at the war, the, the act of uh, 2002, the war resolution? Uh, I got uh, an op-ed in the Capital Times, Madison, Wisconsin, for impeachment after the Downing Street memos came out based on that act because it required a connection to 9-11, which 90% of the troops in Iraq one year after the invasion, still believed that Saddam Hussein was responsible for 9-11. And of course, there's no evidence of that. And no evidence of weapons of mass destruction either. And the president was required uh, to certify both of those before he could act based on that congressional resolution. So I, I think there's an opportunity there uh, to look at that further. Uh, just, uh, I will say that on June 11, 2005, the Democratic Party of Wisconsin passed a resolution that I was the major author of for impeachment of the president based on exactly those concepts. So well, I wonder what your take is on that, that 73 is a wonderful thing, but 2002 also represents an opportunity. Well, so interestingly, um, I think it's important in, in my case to draw a distinction um, between the initial invasion of Iraq, which, which I consider to be the greatest foreign policy disaster of the last 15 years. I mean, just, it was a terrible decision. However, Congress did authorize that. I mean, as, as you're pointing out, there was a 2003 authorization for that. So in that sense, well, I guess there's a... Two, what yeah. I'm saying is it didn't meet the requirements of the Legislative Act. Yeah. Well, and, the, and then part of the problem, too, has been the government has tried to use, and they've, we've seen this in the DOJ briefs coming, coming against our cases, they've tried to use that 03 authorization to fill in the gaps for the 011 where they think it's insufficient. So they'll say, well, 
Congress passed this AUMF in 2002 or three uh, for the Iraq war invasion. So whatever isn't covered by the 01 authorization, that's fine, it's covered by the Iraq one. Well, that was for you know, taking out Saddam and we pulled all of our troops out in 2011. So, I mean, you're bringing up a good point, which is that a lot of these AUMFs are just, they're, they're not tightly written. And that's, that's a big problem because if you, if you don't write them tightly enough, the executive is going to interpret them in the most liberal way possible, and they're going to see it as carte blanche for, as we're going on now, almost two decades with the 2001 authorization. So that's something that makes me nervous as, I, I, as we look at the debate, which has been a debate for five years about the, new, uh, the need for a new authorization, is we need a new authorization, but it needs to be properly written and sunsetted um, as these previous ones were not. Um, so hopefully that kind of gets to your question. Okay. Uh, question here in the middle. Um, mic's coming down. Can I pass the mic down? Oh, well, Sarah, bring it. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Tony Franchina. I'm from Chicago. I was in the Marine Corps from 1968 to 1972. Uh, I wanted this question to Susan which is, I wanted to know, I got HCV from the military gun. I wanted to know how many people that you know had had that happen, and what's the, re what's the ratio between, for HCV between Vietnam era vets and the general population in total? And is there anything being done about it? And maybe Susan, if you could tell us what I, I, I wish I had the absolute data at my fingertips. I don't. Um, my understanding is there were certainly conditions among the troops and in Vietnam that led to their getting, again, that's, we're talking about hepatitis C, which was in, in the food, in the water, and I think the issue for us today, for our American veterans from Vietnam, is that there were a number of illnesses and diseases that the troops were exposed to that were never taken care of. And we know that that has not yet been one of the presumptive illnesses that's covered by the Veterans Administration. There are, however, 18 other illnesses for which um, the, v the VA covers American service people, and it includes conditions like heart <clears throat> conditions, respiratory, different types of cancer and skin conditions. Hepatitis C so far has not been identified as one of those illnesses. And you know, Tony, I think the issue as I'm, I'm thinking about that is it has not been looked at by the National Academies of Science, and it's not been studied through the VA. So there may be some studies in the general population, and today it is such an issue because it's curative, um, and because it can be taken care of by medication that in fact has been developed for, for the general population. So I don't have the exact data, and maybe the recommendation ought to be that it be looked at. The issue I think is a lot of you know that that I deal with is um, the corresponding illnesses from Agent Orange dioxin, the lasting legacy of war. You've brought up an additional issue that in fact needs to be considered. I just would like to quickly respond to the questions about dealing with what we call regular politics or quote legitimate politics and we do, there are some of us who are working on Agent Orange and we have legislation in front of Congress, H.R. 334, from Barbara Lee, um, from Representative Lee. So we certainly agree with working with the politicians, but I think all of us sitting here understand that we the people don't have a huge amount of electoral power anymore. And I would certainly agree with Jonathan that that power lies in what the understanding is of those people who are currently in Congress know. And until they see the power and seeing the power, oh God, I do sound like a 60s person. They see the power in the streets and people mobilizing, 
it's not going to change. And I don't think it makes a difference if you've got somebody who's a representative in the Senate or in the House of Representatives who's a veteran. The issue is what are the politics and what are the politics that we the people give to them and demand of them. And that's what we really need to do. Um, I'm just sitting here thinking about the, your redress program. And God, I wish I had thought about that, right? Getting a petition going. But it was done. And so if you take a look at the actions that were done in the 60s and 70s that made a difference, I really think we need to go back there and we need to do that. And it's not saying I'm going to vote for somebody. You can certainly publicize it, but it means that we demand change. We're not going to get that change, Lord knows, through the Supreme Court and certainly through the current House and Senate or executive branch. But we need to be powerful. I don't think any of us sitting here has that money that the lobbyists use. So it's our voices. And I just, I am hoping that what comes out of this conference is an identification of what we can do and what we can do together. We really are fractured. We need to build those organizations and come together again. So let's see what we can do. And at the conclusion of this conference, that's what we need to do to move ahead. Amen. Right here, John, and then David, and then over here with Harry. I'm John Catalanato. I was a civilian organizer for the American Service and Union between the end of '67 and the end of 1970. And uh, I wanted to thank Sister Thao for, especially for bringing up the quote from uh, President Ho Chi Minh that called uh, the movement in the United States, and especially in the military, the second front. I mean, it brought tears to my eyes just to hear that. I will say that uh, while all the GIs who we were in touch with may have begun their struggle uh, either out of fear of being sent to their death uh, in an unjust war or uh, anger at their offices, that uh, the political GIs who worked in the American Servicemen Union certainly considered themselves a second front. They considered Ho Chi Minh, perhaps not their president, but their hero. And they wanted to do what they could to be that second front in a global war of liberation. So I want to thank again Sister Thao for, uh, Thao for mentioning that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, my name's David Zeiger. I worked at the Oleo Strut Coffee House for two years, and I made the film Sir No Sir that will be showing tomorrow night. Um, uh, I also I want to second that, and also just for bringing up the, the word imperialism. Um, and the I'm tr kind of thinking, trying to think about this the, this issue of you know kind of because this is kind of the nature of this conference. What do we learn from from the 60s and how, how does that get applied today or not applied or whatever. The thing that, that strikes me in, at, at listening to this is that the 60s was obviously a unique moment in history and what made it unique, I believe, was that step by step uh, perceived wisdom about how people should function and how government should function and all of these things all of that wisdom was shattered step by step on just about every front. I mean, even starting with four students sitting in at, at a uh, at a Woolworths that that for for over a hundred years had been segregated. That what was considered to be absolutely beyond the pale, impossible, not the way to function, was how people functioned, and that extended very much into the military and the nature of the GI movement during that time. Um, and my point here is that somehow when you start to relate it to today and the issues, that, the, the extremely difficult situation that we face today, uh, especially today with, with, with Trump, Trump and Pence, that how do you get to that point where people are finally saying, okay, the way that we've been taught and are constantly being told to confront this is no longer 
adequate and we have to, 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 to kind of smash through that. And that really comes up when the whole question of, of electoral politics today, which is just so dominant. Um, but anyway, I, I, I just kind of, in, and in thinking about, you know, you, you, all of these stories, and, and we'll be hearing many of them in the course of this conference, and, and Susan's story, you know, people did things that had never been done before, and that were outrageous. Um, that's, to me, one of the strongest lessons of, of, of that period, and looking at, back on it, and trying to kind of grapple with what it means for today. Just, just right. This is just quick. I think things were done because we really knew we could make a change, and part of what's happening today is that we don't have that belief any longer. So part of it is how do how do we get that back and then move on and understand that it really is as simple as starting out and getting people together and putting one foot in front of the other. And I think, David, it's that belief. I, and I can speak for myself, I really thought when I got up there and did this and marched in the, in the parade, in the uniform, in the demonstration, that we were going to end the war. And just because it didn't end the next day, I knew that we would have an impact. And I don't think we have that belief anymore. We knew that we basically were working to end the war and to work with the Vietnamese struggle, because we believed in that. What do we have today except we seem to be against something? So I'll just say again, we need to get it together and to get that belief moving and to create that change. If I could say something real quick to add to what Susan said. I think though, because this is a generational, intergenerational conversation, right? I think that so February 15, 2003 was the largest global demonstration against war ever in the history of mass movements. It was, the, it was the largest ever. So the question has to be asked, why didn't that demonstration have the same impact of a generation ago? And, th and so I have my own analysis on that. I'm not saying my analysis is the correct analysis, but it's one that I have. I think that what you saw from 2003 onward, and even today, is what I would term, and I was talking with David about this last night, what I would term is the NGOization of our movement, if you will, which I don't believe was that dominant a generation ago. I mean, if I was to look at it through the lens, as David Ziegler brings up the civil rights movement, which then became a black power movement, there's a distinct difference between the Black Lives Matter movement and the Black Power movement a generation ago. There's a serious contrast there in terms of where the power of that is coming from and where the actual central decisions of that are being made and who is actually funding and, and, and actually funneling those movements. That has a large impact in terms of the power that comes from the base, if you will. The reason why February 15 couldn't stop a movement and this generation by the late 60s was having a serious impact by 71, the military being dispirited, uh, mutinous, uh, fragments, is, is this movement here got down to the actual barracks, got down to the actual shop level, got down to the actual mechanic level, to the actual person loading the bomb. And until we can actually get to that level, to get people to not just believe in Danny Glover, I love Danny Glover, uh, to, not, to not just believe in Cold Pink, I love Cold Pink, uh, to not just believe in David Courtright, David is awesome, but to actually believe in, them, actually believe in themselves, right, that, that the makers of history, the chains of history are the actual people, until we get to that point, Susan. So we'll work on it. Together. <laughs> Together. That's what we're here for. Yeah. Uh, other questions? So Harry is here. Um, and up in the back will be John next. Okay. And then. Uh, hi, my name is Harry Haynes, Vietnam vet. Got caught up in the GI movement. It seemed like the right thing to do at the time. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I want to tell you that Dr. King's speech at Riverside Church uh, was printed, it was circulated among soldiers. The first time I read that speech, I was a soldier in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. King, as he very often did, nailed it. 
And the sentence that I will never forget is we are adding cynicism to the process of dying, mm -hmm. which was right on. And I, uh, one of the uh, things that I do recall from our period of uh, resistance uh, was that from time to time, we actually had a pretty cozy and very productive relationship with civilian reporters who were working in media because the reporters were smart enough to figure out that uh, what they were hearing from uh, Washington was uh, a pack of lies. Uh, and uh, there, uh, there was a kind of mutual reliance uh, between us and also uh, some trusted reporters uh, out there who, who proved to be very helpful. And I'm wondering if the, the, the current generation of uh, uh, vets uh, who have been through that meat grinder uh, have uh, understand that kind of relationship, if it exists. I mean, the 60 Minutes clip uh, you, you showed, Jonathan, uh, seemed uh, very important to me for a number of reasons, one of which it, it, it exists, it actually happened. Uh, and I'm not sure that the uh, issues that face members of, of your generation are getting that kind of attention. Um, what I would say is, um, I would say that it's, 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 it's a lot tougher, I believe, uh, for us to break through the corporate press. I do say corporate. Um, we don't have, in, in my generation, within the corporate press, I, 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 and you may have a different opinion, we, we, don't, we don't have the Dan Rathers on the ground, if you will. Um, we talked about Fallujah earlier. Uh, there were no embedded reporters in Fallujah. Uh, the one reporter that, that uh, got out of Fallujah, they shot on that reporter. Um, it was an assassination attempt, in our opinion. Um, However, again, this moral authority. So Winter Soldier 71, uh, some of you were there. That was totally blacked out in the corporate press. Winter Soldier 2008, again, totally blacked out in the corporate press. Um, but again, when you talk about active duty service members, as difficult as it is to organize active duty service members, it is almost impossible, almost. They could, but it's almost impossible to deny the moral authority of active duty service members. Um, so I believe that to a degree that we could actually, uh, within our peace and justice organizations, and this is an internal discussion we need to have, because the right does this. It's documented by the Southern Poverty Law Center. It's documented by people like Marjorie Kahn. The right organizes within the military. They do. When I say the right, I'm talking about the, the extreme. I'm not talking about Republican. I'm talking about extreme radical Nazi Clan right organized in the military. So we actually see ground when we're not in the barracks doing our work. Um, and that's an internal discussion. So again, I don't know if I answered your question, but I would say that during the appeal for redress, Fenton Communications, David, was very, very instrumental in getting us uh, a load of press. But at the end of the day, I'm not, I, I think the real information is that hand-to-hand -hand information someone was talking about in terms of doing it on, on the ground. So what I would add to that um, that I saw very intimately when I was in Kuwait um, is that you have some very good news organizations, New York Times, Washington Post, um, that, will, that will report on stories that to me sitting on the ground have a ton of significance watching the campaign occur. So there was one story that was done in Washington Post. I'm sitting there looking at the press releases from the White House and from the officially reported troop numbers in Iraq, and they are not adding up at all, at all. And basically they weren't adding up because what they were doing was they were taking guys TDY from ships in, in the Med, putting them for 30 days in Iraq and then moving them back and moving them back and moving them back because that doesn't have to be reported to Congress as an officially reported troop number. Um, but I don't think that the average American person, if they cared to know that, would consider that to be acceptable. Um, and that story was, I saw that story written a couple times in the Washington Post and New York Times. It's not that those reputable news outlets or corporate media, the good, the good ones I'm talking about, um, that they don't get the stories, it's that sometimes those stories don't have the emphasis that they should. Sometimes I think people don't read behind the headline 
what does this really mean? Well, this really means that the, the troop numbers being reported to Congress, now I don't know what kind of classified briefings they're getting on that, that those are not accurate. Well, that's a huge deal to the American people when you're talking about limiting the size of a war that's in the boots on ground number, which was always quoted by the Obama administration and still quoted by the, by the Trump administration. So I just use that as one example, um, but I just think it's something important to keep in mind. And I don't know really how you combat that other than a more critical reading of, of news by, by the wider public. Um, I have three people on the queue here. Uh, John there, the woman here, and then Michael. John McAuliffe from the Fund for Reconciliation and Development and the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Um, I want to do a little contemporaneous izing on the Vietnamese side uh, because I was struck both from Ms. Tao's remarks and from remarks at the 50th anniversary of My Lai that a, a number of us were part of that the, you could listen to the Vietnamese speak and you could think they've all become pacifists. Well, they obviously haven't. Uh, and they can't afford in their context to be. Um, there could have been a fourth bomb on the pin because one of the other military experiences that Vietnam suffered was in 1978 when the Chinese came across the border in the north. Um, 79. 79, 79, <laughs> right. <laughs> after the year after the uh, and today, every day, in waters that are historically Vietnamese, there is a Chinese militarization and Chinese threats that have forced the withdrawal of oil exploration projects. And I would say from Vietnamese friends, North Center and South, an existential concern that the 3,000 year history with China has not ended and that we are in this very contradictory situation now. Just before we were in Vietnam, there was a US aircraft carrier for the first time in Da Nang. Um, and it was embraced by both governments as an important expression of a common concern about China. One thing that came out of that, which was very positive, and I don't know where the public relations genius came from, but when the US naval personnel went ashore, it's not unusual for them to do some social service work, but in this case, they went to two places that worked with the victims of Agent Orange. And it was noted by everyone in Vietnam, if not in the United States, that that was a qualitatively different acknowledgement on the part of the US government, or at least the US military, that there are victims of Agent Orange and they do need special attention. I don't know, if Madam Nin or Ms. Tao, if you want to comment or you can just go on. Maybe you could think about it, and we'll come back to you, okay? <laughs> oh, the next question, and we have another one there. Yep, on the queue. Thank you so much for the panel. It's been really, really rich. Uh, my name is Kim Kompak. I'm at University of Hawaii, and I do demilitarization work in Hawaii and the Pacific. And um, I just, over here, uh, the brother was talking about the word imperialism, and I'm, I'm grateful, how grateful he was to hear that word. And I'd just like to throw the word capitalism into the mix as well, um, you know. <laughs> Um, on a couple of different layers. I mean, if I'm a working class or working poor kid, um, you know, the only way I'm going to have an education is through the military. The only way I'm going to have a chance at a house is through you know, the military. And the recruiters know that. They're going to go to the immigrant schools. They're going to go to the working class schools. And they're just ripe for the picking. And that, uh, I think that until we have um, a free college education, 
it's always going to be easy to get people to sign up for the military. We're always going to have that steady stream. Um, so, but we're in an interesting moment, I think, with in income inequality and the injustice of that. We have a lot more socialists being elected. I think that's an opportunity we can really exploit. Like that, um, that that needs to be talked about. And then on the other side, the military industrial complex. We haven't used that term today. You know, what Eisenhower said. Um, even as he's perpetuating the war in Vietnam. We talk a lot about government and focusing our activism at the government and what the government's doing wrong. But of course, you know, the, the corporations are pulling the strings and we, we all know that too. And so I just thought I would, I would put that into the mix. We have RIMPAC happening in Hawaii this summer and uh, we have 27 nations, I think including Israel for the first time. Um, and, and there's the government side, but then there's all this money being made on the weapons. And um, that has to, we have to make that part of our activism too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael and Ferris are next. Oh, sorry. I have time for probably a couple more questions, and then I want to, of course, give the panel members a, a chance to. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm Michael McPherson uh, with Veterans for Peace. And this is a comment, so I apologize for not being a question. Um, and I'll reiterate, I'm supposed to speak on Thursday, so I'll reiterate this, but I had to say this. So um, one thing when I hear people over the years talk about the Vietnam War and the peace movement and how the war ended, and I'm hearing some of this now, um, I remind people, at least from my perspective, being kind of a kid when this was going on, but through history, um, is that the war ended because of the people in Vietnam. Um, <laughs> That's why, and I want to remind people, if you look at the numbers, when we talk about day com today, today compared to then, and I don't know if this is exactly accurate, but for example, 1968, the number of U.S. killed in January were 498, or in February, 506, and it goes on from there. So there were a lot of dead Americans coming back, a whole lot compared to today. Um, so that creates a reality that's very different then you couple that, not just because we don't have the draft now, but you couple those deaths with a draft. So all of a sudden, the reality of me possibly being the person to come back um, makes that connection that's, that's lacking. So I'm from the so-called first Gulf War, same war right now, it's not a different war. Um, it, that first ground and air campaign happened so fast. Um, US Americans like, unfortunately, victory and when there's no deaths and no price to pay, because there were so few deaths, there was celebration and everything was cool. So we have something in the middle right now where there's not that many deaths, it's dragging on. It's not that people don't care, but they don't really see that connection. And the last thing I wanted to say is that people do believe they can make a change, but they believe they can make a change about stuff that's going on with them. So that's why you see a lot of movements taking place right now, um, ascending, whereas our movement is not. And because we don't have that connection I just talked about, people, people aren't you know, making that connection. But people care. Because when you start talking to them about what we're doing in the world, they'll be like, yeah, I know. But I got to go deal with this. So I, the reason I felt like I needed to say this now is because as we move forward and thinking about how we're going to make a difference, we need to set the table understanding, at least I say this. I, this is what I think anyway set the table for thinking about how we're going to move forward, not in the misconception that we ended the war by ourselves. Death had a whole lot within the war. So how do we do that in the absence of that with, with the deaths happening to people you know, across the globe and not to so-called our people? Okay, thanks. So, so I think you make a really interesting point, and just really quickly, the trend you're talking about is only going to be exacerbated. Because as we go to more sanitized conflict with more drones, I saw that in Iraq every day. The casualty numbers are going to continue to go down, and our ability to affect other countries militarily is going to go up. So that's why I'm advocating for more of a movement oriented on veterans. Because again, I, I keep I keep saying this. You know, I agree with you that it's not that the public doesn't care necessarily. They may in in a way that that is intellectual. But if you contrast like the, up, the basically the political uprising over the healthcare issue that occurred versus um, you know, what, for instance, when we went back into 
into Iraq with no congressional authorization, I think that that's because people can very t tangibly feel when their health care is taken away. And when you have an all-volunteer force with a very small percentage serving, that's just not as tangible in the population. So I really feel like the way forward, if you're going to have an effect, is that it has to be centered on veterans' organizations because they have the moral authority within the society to, to drive that issue forward. Now, that's not saying there's not a role for people that, that have never served or that, you know, that are concerned about it. Obviously, that's a, that's a magnifying force as well. But I think you made some great points, and I just, I just want to point that out. So. A couple of questions, and then we'll maybe ask the panelists to come and come back and respond to several of them. So, Paul Cox, who was the yeah, hi, leader uh, Paul, of our Paul Cox, uh, recovering Marine from the Vietnam War, um, and, uh, and and former GI activist, at Camp Swamp Lagoon, North Kakalaki. Um, this question actually is for for Nathan. Um, perhaps you could comment on House Joint Resolution 89 that's put forward by. David's good friend Jim uh, Banks, uh, a Republican from Indiana. Uh, it's a joint authorization for military force that's basically uh, what it appears to me, what I've read about it is that it's just a completely open-ended yeah. replacement for the 2001 uh, AUMF. So I'm not familiar with that specific one. I know there's been so many drafts of them. Um, I know Lindsey Graham had his own, which was basically another carte blanche, um, you know, AUMF. And I've, I've said this, you know, and I try to say this in my op-eds and, and all that. I, I, my personal opinion is, as I've already stated, they need to be sunsetted. They need to be precise in their language. I think that's the best thing for the country. But right now, we're not even having a real debate. Like, let's have a real debate. Let's, let's get it to the floors of Congress. I mean, I was very uplifted this year to see they did actually have a vote for the repeal of the 01 AUMF. Um, that actually had two Republicans uh, vote f for repeal, Rand Paul and, and Mike Lee, but there were 11 Democrats that voted against it, so we still have the 01 authorization on the books. But it, I mean, in a way, that's still encouraging because at least, at least there's a discussion, at least those votes are being counted, right? Because what's so frustrating is when they hide from the vote and they hide from the accountability that that vote signifies. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the, the actual language in, in that one, but I guess that's just my general take on those. Okay. So in terms of reaching the American public, um, I've been, uh, my name is David Parsons, I've been teaching the, uh, I teach history in college, I've been teaching the Vietnam War for the last 12 or 13 years. To, to, to students who are between the ages of 18 to 21, and, and I find the things that, you know, I will, they, they're touched by the death, they're touched by the death of Americans as much as they're touched by the death of, Vietnam, uh, of the Vietnamese when, we, uh, when I present them with that material. But lately, you know, I've been noticing uh, um, as we see like the rise of youth politics around uh, uh, Bernie Sanders <clears throat> and that kind of politics, you know, Bernie Sanders was, was laughed at for suggesting a free college tuition, um, which the budget would be about 70 to $80 billion a year. I mean, the United States spends $700 billion in Afghanistan a year. Um, when I give those numbers to my students, that connects to them. Um, just two semesters ago, a group of three of them went and got arrested at Chuck Schumer's office after I told them this. Um, and so like, I told them this, I mean, I, I'm not taking credit. I'm just saying that the connection, you know, when we, everyone has mentioned this amazing speech that everyone should read, I'm sure you all have, the Beyond Vietnam speech that Martin Luther King made in 1967. But what people forget about that speech, or maybe not forget, is that he was connecting all of these issues. That's what's so compelling about that speech. It's not that it's just, it's just, the war is wrong, and if we end the war, American society goes on perfectly. The, the, the war is a, is a symptom of a sick society. The war is a symptom of capitalism, not caring about people, not caring about American people, not caring about Vietnamese people. So if we can connect the lived experience of the hell of, of, of American life for poor people in this country, if we can connect that to the deaths of the people that are overseas that we should care about as much as American lives, then I think we have ripe space to, to touch young people and to build outrage in America because Americans should be outraged about what's going on. Thank you. If I can, uh, 
<laughs> if I can just add to that real quick, hey, man, first of all, um, I was raised in the Baptist church. Um, <laughs> this is 50 years uh, since the shutdown in France, which was sparked by students and youth. We're, we're here at the University of Notre Dame. So his, his segue, he, he gives me a lead into the fact that, that when we talk to our younger activists, I say younger, potential younger activists, I say younger because I'm 41 years old, is that we, we shouldn't just talk history, we gotta make history come alive in terms of the role that youth and students have historically played, historically and presently, in terms of being a spark and catalyst for mass <coughs> movement change. Uh, most of you in this room, some of you at least, started out somewhere in a classroom. All of us were in some classroom. So I think to the degree that we can make that connection, and David uh, is exemplifying this in terms of the role, although there's no, we don't have any college students in the room, but the role that the academy can play uh, in terms of not only fostering this dialogue, being a spark and callous for young people, I think is vital. So thank you. Great. Well, let me give uh, Susan and Ms. Tao and uh, Jonathan or uh, Nathan a chance to make some final comments. Um, Um, I, my final comment, besides to organize and to agree with members of the audience that we need to connect both the issues that are dealing with and, and we have, and I know that Michael will talk more about this, but we will be talking about the Poor People's Campaign and the fact that we are today continuing to talk about the disparity between those who have and people who don't, and those who go to war are the same people that we need to work with, all of us, and to take a look at combining the issues and to move forward as a movement. And I just, I, I've been asked by uh, Mrs. Tao for another donation to the War Remnants Museum. So just to change the topic for a second, um, I brought her the hat <laughs> that I just had her. Um, part of the exhibit. And, and I have to say, to be able to donate this to Vietnam and to peace and justice is just, it's extraordinary for me. And for many years now, to be able to work with the Vietnamese and to see how far the country and the people have gotten despite American intervention and attempts to put down the country is an extraordinary gift. So, so thank you and my gift to Vietnam. So sorry, uh, Madame Tong Nữ thì nên we have made uh, translate um, clearly <laughs> in English. Uh, tôi có um, hỏi bà Susan về uh, cái uh, những cái uh, kỹ vật mà còn giữ được của cái hình này khi mà um, tham gia cái cuộc biểu tình này thì uh, uh, rất may là được uh, bà uh, tặng cho cái cái nón này đây là một cái à, kỹ vật rất là quý và như tôi nói trong bài phát biểu á, thì à, chúng tôi sẽ đưa cái triển lãm à, tiếp tục đi lưu động ở nhiều nơi và ở, ở dưới cái bức hình này thì sẽ có một cái à, hiện vật thì nó sẽ à, rất là sinh động cho cái trưng bày sắp tới của chúng tôi nếu mà tiếp tục mang cái triển lãm này đi nhiều nơi khác. Uh, Dr. Thảo had uh, the opportunity to ask Susan uh, whether she had any sort of uh, object left from, you know, from this picture, years. you know, <laughs> uh, where she's leading the demonstration. And so it's so uh, sort of fitting and wonderful to, to get the, the, the hat from, uh, from her. And uh, uh, it will help uh, the museum when it goes on the road to reach other provinces of Vietnam to explain about the anti-war movement among uh, active duty soldiers and veterans uh, 
to also show this is a one real thing <laughs> that was from exactly those uh, those times. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, làm thế nào để xây dựng hòa bình và không có chiến tranh nữa đó. thì như là trong cái bài phát biểu tôi cũng đã nói là bảo tàng thì đón tiếp rất là nhiều khách những người không có đến bảo tàng thì sẽ không có cái cơ hội biết được những cái tổn thất và những cái nạn nhân thật là khủng khiếp của chiến tranh thì hiện nay bảo tàng cũng đang bảo trợ cho một nhóm nạn nhân chất độc da cam và họ tự làm ra những cái sản phẩm À, bằng tay để mà à, bán cho du khách để nuôi sống bản thân và như tôi nói là có 4,8 triệu người bị nhiễm chất độc da cam hiện nay đó thì 90% trong số họ thì cũng không có việc làm để tự nuôi sống bản thân mình thì à, bảo tàng ngoài cái bảo trợ cho họ à, một cái không gian để à, à, bán những cái sản phẩm như vậy thì cũng đã à, làm chủ hôn để kết hôn được à, mấy mấy bạn yêu nhau trong cái nhóm này thì họ cũng có những cái nhu cầu rất là bình thường của con người và cũng có nhiều em thì cũng đã qua thời gian thì cũng đã mất đi rồi và từ đó thì tôi cũng suy nghĩ đến một cái cuộc triển lãm trong tương lai <cười> <cười> um, so she you know the she conceives uh, uh, of the role of the museum of course to um, to be the memory of the past uh, war, but also of how to to lead it into uh, today's and the future's uh, peace. And so, for example, uh, one of the things that the museum does is that it is sponsoring a group of Agent Orange victims. 90% of them have no uh, source of livelihood. And so they, they help those uh, those people um, produce some <coughs> handicraft objects for sale that will help them make a, a, a living. They even have uh, um, blessed a couple of weddings among those uh, Agent Orange uh, victims. Yeah, yeah, trong tương lai thì uh, tôi nghĩ đến một cái triển lãm mà ở đó uh, nói về nạn nhân chất độc da cam của cả hai phía Việt Nam và Mỹ. And so and now she she is planning thinking uh, forward uh, of a possibility of a joint exhibit uh, of uh, agent of Vietnamese agent orange uh, victims and of uh, uh, American uh, agent orange victims và together và từ cái cuộc đi đi kèm với cuộc triển lãm đó thì có thể là mời uh, những cái nạn nhân uh, da cam của cả hai phía mà thế hệ thứ hai hoặc thứ ba họ sẽ nói về những cái khó khăn và những cái uh, chia sẻ về cái cuộc sống của họ ở trong cái cái cuộc triển lãm đó. And uh, uh, they plan to invite second and third generation uh, agent orange uh, survivors who can share you know the the difficult lives that they are leading now. Và những người đến bảo tàng thì có thể cùng cảm nhận và chia sẻ cũng như cái công sức và tiếng nói của mình để xây dựng hòa bình và chúng ta sẽ góp phần để làm cho thế giới không có chiến tranh nữa. Từ những cái việc như vậy. That's one of the ways to contribute to to building peace. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Two final quick points. The late Mark Raskin, who just passed away a few months ago, passed away from this life, uh, uh, always said, when he had a chance to say it, was that the highest office in the land, I don't know if he, this was his statement, but he certainly said, the highest office in the land is that of the public citizen. Uh, so I want to reiterate that. And the fact that Dr. King's name uh, has been mentioned many times this evening, uh, which it should, I just want to reiterate that he is the only non-president on the mall memorialized in the way that he is as an extension of a mass movement. And, and when he did make his speech a time to break silence, uh, he was not speaking as a head of state or even an elected official. In actuality, he was speaking as a private citizen. And so I just want to just 
lay that upon all of us as we, rem as we think about uh, either the tap or untapped power and influence that we have uh, to move society as it needs to be moved. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any final pearls of wisdom. I'm totally out if I had any in the first place. Um, so thanks for putting up with me. And uh, thanks for being here. And it's been really enjoyable. So. Another round of applause. Sure.